you, Ben. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, great. Um, so for yeah, for those of you who um, are new to Katie Byte, we are a computer science academy that teaches students ages eight to eighteen computer science. Uh, we have a progressive curriculum that starts from um, the beginner to intermediate to advanced classes. Uh, beginner starting with Java blocks, where we build our own um, block-based programming language, and all the way up to advanced classes where students are prepared for computing Olympiads um, and AI machine learning um, classes and be able to participate in these uh, computing competitions and also uh, do research in, in uh, computer science. So Danny will be giving us a talk about his experience uh, working in machine learning and doing research. Um, and so let's get started with a few of the questions that people have submitted prior to this talk. So um, the first question we have would be, what is AI? So AI or artificial intelligence is a big class of problems. It's a way to solve those problems. So it doesn't, um, it is a, a combination of many different disciplines, including statistics, uh, neuroscience, biology even, some biology inspired mechanisms to solve problems. And uh, it's a very diverse and a large field that has many subcategories of problems that can be solved within AI. And with and why AI is so big today um, is the fact that it is, uh, with the increasing compute, computing power, we're able to solve those problems more efficiently. So AI is using data that is all around the world. Uh, it's been generated uh, continuously, like let's say from your phone, from your computer from a device that you have at, uh, at your home and is able with uh, the large amounts of data to make meaningful conclusions about the world. So that is using statistics, uh, either through using statistics or uh, more advanced techniques to, to actually uh, make a meaningful conclusion. And uh, yeah, that is pretty much uh, the summary of it and the biggest advantage of AI, let's say, over traditional programming techniques to solve the same problem is that uh, it would be inefficient to do in terms of uh, pure programming, uh, so doing that manually. Uh, with AI, we specify a generic class, a generic model that is then able to solve the, the entire class of problems. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Yep. Uh, and um, what are some examples of everyday uses of uh, AI? So AI is used from everywhere. Your phone, whenever you search uh, something on the internet uh, and is able to provide something more specialized to your interest in previous searches and the recommendation engines. So like whenever you go on Netflix and you, you're you being suggested movies and in research even more so. so uh, for example, right now we're using AI to in manufacturing uh, parts that are very difficult to do so in automatically because of um, how precise control it requires and how variable the, the part is and the, the circumstances of the environment. So there is many applications and they're constantly expanding. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you give an example, uh, a tangible example of what you just explained? Sure. So, for example, we we use our phone, we open our emails, right? The mm -hmm. most important use of AI is to not have you look at spam the first okay. thing when you wake up in the morning. So, how is the computer able to uh, identify if an email is spam or not spam? Uh, and it is doing that purely on AI by knowing what spam looks like and not showing it to you, putting it directly into the spam folder. Mm -hmm. um, that is probably the most uh, everyday use that everyone is familiar with. But apart from that, there is no limitation what it can be used, right? Uh, AI can be applied to any problem, even traditional uh, computer science uh, problem that it can be solved with uh, AI. Maybe not as efficiently, mm -hmm. but it can still be solved. Okay, I see. And point then... out, this is Benjamin, by the way, on the call, that like some of the more um, Newsworthy technologies are obviously driven not only by AI, but particularly with deep learning. So, like obviously the self-driving cars, but 
also facial recognition, facial recognition technology and speech uh, translation technology. Um, all of that is really being assisted with this recent wave of GPU assisted computation. That is correct. So without that uh, leap in, in technology of having stronger graphics cards, we would not be able to do uh, these kind of things such as uh, self-driving cars. Uh, self-driving cars have a, a dedicated computer inside the car that a uh, few years ago would require an entire room to run and operate inside. And right now we're able to, to do all those computations on the car and that's why we're able to do AI. Uh, <laughs> and it's going to be applicable in more and more domains as computing power becomes widely more available. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then most of your research is done in machine learning. Can you uh, briefly talk about what, uh, what the difference is between machine learning and AI? So AI is a wider class of problems. Machine learning is a specific and a class that encompasses uh, specific techniques for solving problems. For example, when you try to classify something, right? Uh, like, is this a person? Is this a dog? This is the kind of uh, machine learning techniques that can be applied. So uh, machine learning specific techniques. Or when you try to predict, let's say, the price of a house, uh, that is also part of what uh, machine learning encompasses. But AI is can be expanded to much more than that. For example, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Boston Dynamics. It's also close to Massachusetts, um, to your... Uh, uh, headquarters. So, okay. Um, so yeah. So like they do robots, and those robots, if you have seen videos of them, can run autonomously. That is also AI, um, and that is a different class that is called reinforcement learning. And then it has a wide, um, and then it can be expanded to even wider classes of problems. So I have personally worked with both machine learning and AI. So for machine mm -hmm. learning, I have used it on traditional applications of statistics, prediction analysis, and classification. But for AI, I've worked on generating, for example, human theoretic models, so like human behavior models. So like, how does a person behave? And we use AI to do that based on different data. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers more or less the question. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what are you currently um, doing for your, your research? So, for my research, uh, I've just uh, finished working on a one-year project that we worked on um, identifying on open source projects, sources of technical debt, which is a term that means that where does software break? So we, would we were able to build and identify different factors that contribute to that and uh, predict when the software will break just by looking at the, at the source code. And currently, um uh, and uh, currently i've been working for the last uh three months on a project that involves uh, creating human behavior models so what we do is we take survey data from african countries and using those survey data and responses we're able to create and uh, a behavior model about how a person would behave in those countries so if they feel uh, ethnically oppressed how are they going to respond? If they have lack of water, how are they going to respond to those stimuli? And this is very useful for a policymaker, a, a social scientist to study and examine different variables uh, by changing different variables on how a person behaves. So that is a very applicable um, uh, part of research. Mm -hmm. um, and lately, uh, just recently, I just started working with a DARPA funded project on uh, manufacturing uh, carbon fiber um, uh, helicopter blades. So before that, the entire process was done by hand and layering down uh, layer by layer of carbon fiber is very time consuming and labor intensive. So what we're able to do is use uh, automation and robotics and uh, um, artificial intelligence to be able to adapt the robotic arm based on the flexibility and rigidity of the material. Mm -hmm. um, that pretty much summarizes my research. Okay, are you working on those two projects simultaneously? So, right now I have completed uh, most of my projects and I'm starting on working on the DARPA-funded project uh, starting January. 
Oh, okay, interesting. Um, and what have what are the biggest challenges uh, for you, the first um, project that you had been working on with the behavioral um, social um, uh, AI project? So uh, a big uh, a big problem with every research project is that you don't know where you're going or which direction you're heading. Okay. You're kind of uh, second guessing. So uh, because nobody else has done the same thing before, otherwise you'd have it's not publishable, it's not research. So you don't have a good reference point many times about what is uh, the go a good direction to take. So a lot of it is trial and error. Um, a lot of it is many times error and you have to keep motivated on that uh, and continue working. And that, mm -hmm. yeah, that takes a lot of mental energy to, to continuously try and reiterate your ideas and uh, improve. Mm -hmm. And for um, for that kind of um, research, are you working on the field, or do you get the data? Well, where do you get the the all the data? So there are, for example, for one of the projects we did with uh, open source software, we we created a novel method to get the data. So we uh, we introduced a way to to gather data that nobody else was able to, to do that before us. Um, and because it was so much data, which like I explained, helps a lot in machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to build something that a machine learning technique that was very accurate as compared to what existed before. Okay, and then um, how how do you pick and choose um, what types of research programs to partake in? So um, it's completely based on interest, but for mm -hmm. academia, a big factor is um, like you have to enjoy the people you work with because oftentimes it is a very stressful thing. So uh, a bigger factor to me is not just enjoying the project itself, but enjoying who I'm working with and that um, there is some sort of uh, common understanding and common, um, chem there is a chemistry, a team chemistry um, that we are able to all of us work and cooperate together. It's far more important, uh, I've realized, than actually uh, working on an interesting problem because you cannot work on an interesting problem alone. You always need help you always need more people and that is the biggest factor i think in, right, in the right. research. Mm -hmm. yeah you have to really um have a good synergy with the people you work with so that you can be productive and also um get the most done because everyone is uh working towards the same goal mm -hmm. yeah um, okay, cool. And then do you have any advice for um, some of our students who are interesting, uh, interested in pursuing research? Uh, it is a great thing that they start so early. Um, it, what I can tell them is that uh, based on uh, the experience they get and the more they're able to, uh, to learn at least the basics and have a, a basic understanding of the tools, which is, let's say, machine learning, AI, programming, whatever you want to call it. Uh, research itself is uh, then becomes a creative thing on how you apply those tools. So my advice is focus right now that uh, you have the advantage on mastering the tools, and then you can find ways to creatively uh, apply them in different problems, in different situations, um, different <laughs> domains. I see. Um, Again, and I have an interesting comment here, which is that uh, when I was in university, a lot of my friends who applied towards graduate programs, they did a lot better if they had done undergraduate research. And if they've done high school research, they, they had an even higher chance of being accepted to whatever graduate program they wanted to. And it wasn't just like in academia, but if they wanted to go to industry, but within industry, uh, work at a research division like Microsoft Research or Google AI Labs or something like that, whereupon a lot of the work is uh you know uh, similar to in academia um then uh it was also like a huge advantage if they have done independent research in the past and doing independent research is something that takes a long time for students to become acquainted with the process of asking questions planning your time um writing communicating working in teams like danny's talking about and so um, i'm sure danny you would feel like if you had started in middle school it would have catapulted you a lot faster right along that path that is absolutely correct and yeah uh, but it didn't happen because of the lack of resources at the time and um so that is like uh, the disadvantage my my own disadvantage but yeah 
it is an advantage for people today that have the ability to do that. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, if they're really interested in this domain, it would be, you know, uh, and they have the means to, and the resources for that, to that they're available to them, then it doesn't make sense not to pursue such a direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then um, for applying to um, grad school with, uh, uh, for computer science, do you, is it mandatory that you have a undergrad degree also in the computer science or um, is that not a prerequisite? It is not a prerequisite. Um, so, but it does help that you can demonstrate that you can work because a lot of what you will be doing is programming. So if you are working on AI and, and so on, but as long as like, for example, if it's within engineering, it is much easier than if it is a uh, social sciences and then you decide to go into computer science um, that they will be much more interested in, in working with you. Uh, because mm -hmm. graduate and research is not just, um, let's say, it's more of a job than it is, let's say, learning in class. So it is, it does involve a lot of learning, constantly learning, but it is more of a, a work and a creative one that is. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and so for um, the students who are interested in majoring in computer science, um, or even, even if they're not, um, how important is it, do you think, for them to have a background in research um, during high school? Or, or is it, if, if they don't, uh, like it's not really that mandatory for them to um, partake in this kind of research in high school? And like, if, if that gives them a significant amount of um, advantage? The, the advantage that they get by participating in research uh, is is excellent. Like they will be able to do a lot more and a lot faster because uh, even with their ability to learn a lot faster as they're younger and uh, have the experience that they can then demonstrate to to let's say other researchers, institutions, and so on. The opportunities that they're going to have in terms of let's say getting into a research program earlier right, is going to be much more significant and the delay might be unnecessary if they do so interest and do it too late. Uh, but yeah, like the fact that they have the, the ability and it is available to them, I think uh, they should take advantage of it if that's their interest. Okay, great. And then uh, we also had another question, which is what are the math requirements for AI? A lot of parents are interested um, in, in that area. Correct. So, um, like uh, we explained before, AI is more of a conceptual method of solving problems, different kinds of problems. There is a lot of math behind it, uh, and like linear algebra that is not exactly taught in to high school students at the extent that it is uh, used in machine learning. However, the way that the course and uh, the entire content is designed is so that they don't need to uh, to know uh, very to have a very good background in, in linear algebra or math itself. Uh, we focus on the on the conceptual aspects of AI and machine learning. We do provide detailed explanations of the mathematics behind it and the why and how it works. Uh, but this is uh, but this is not required for them to understand machine learning to understand the math behind it. Uh, okay. But it definitely helps them to to grow. Okay. Um, and then also, uh, what are some AI-related um, camps and research options uh, for these students? Right, so a lot of universities start offering them uh, as we go by. So NASA has a summer camp that is focused on machine learning and uh, robotics. Um, they use, uh, I think, Lego robotics to, to program and to do stuff autonomously. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for any parent, it depends on where they want uh, Location-wise, right? So, my advice would be to look at the universities closest to you. Most likely, they are going to have a, a, a summer camp that is maybe focused on machine learning as well. Uh, but if not, we also offer online courses for uh, the summer in machine learning and uh, CS uh, 82, 84, and 85. Yeah, I do want to interrupt Alisa Benjamin again that uh, the MIT Prime's research program, the CS division. 
is relatively convenient for a lot of the participants if they're in Massachusetts. Um, and that program is pretty competitive and difficult to get into. It requires a whole slew of problem sets and recommendation letters uh, to be able to apply. And the application is usually due around the 1st of December. So we just finished the application this year for MIT Primes. But that's like a one-year research program uh, whereby you're able to shadow a professor uh, or also the graduate students uh, of that professor to solve a research problem. And in our experience, talking to a lot of the students, we've had about a dozen or so do this program. Um, a lot of them are actually doing machine learning. Uh, and even if they're not doing deep learning, a lot of it is standard supervised learning problems. So they'll use uh, more traditional approaches. So um, we find that students who are applying to these programs who've had some research experience definitely have a leg up. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then I, we have um, a, someone in the chat who asked if this, um, if what we're talking about is related to coding. So I guess uh, we have not addressed like the connection between um, AI and coding. So <laughs> let's let's talk about that. Um, yeah, and, mm -hmm. So uh, AI and machine learning is a programming technique. You can think of it uh, a way to program. That is. Uh, uh, a subclass of programming, right? So programming is required to be able to do machine learning, but machine learning can do a lot more than traditional programming, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. And what kind of um, CS foundation would they need to be able, uh, would students be able to need to get to uh, be able to um, work on these types of uh, machine learning and AI projects? So basic programming knowledge is um, is required, so like to be able to, to write basic programs with for loops. But uh, okay. it is not uh, necessary to uh, to be a very good programmer to understand machine learning. And the way that we focus the course is that uh, we focus on the concepts. So the concepts are usually more difficult to understand than um, the details of it. And because some of the things are not intuitive. So that's the, th our focus is to make those things intuitive. And then when they get a chance to, let's say, go into a graduate course or uh, a, a college course, that they're going to learn the details of the mathematics and, and study them in detail and proof with theorems and so on, they will be able to have a much, even a much better understanding of what they're doing than struggling with the concepts at the time. OK. I yeah, see. And I want to point out that in our curriculum, um, it's after CSOMB. So we expect to have done object-oriented programming prior to taking any machine learning classes. Mm -hmm. And Ben, if you can elaborate more on the um, the course, our, our course progression, and I can also pull it up too. Yeah, so our course progression has CS A2, then A4, then A5 after CSOMB. So we expect students to have learned a programming language. In, this, in our curriculum, it's Java prior to doing machine learning. Uh, and have a lot of experience with standard, uh, like like you said, loop and array based algorithms, um, binary search, uh, and uh, simple data structures. Um, we don't expect them to have proven any kind of searching algorithms or sorting algorithms or built tree or graphs, um, although those are in later classes. So uh, what you would consider kind of like uh, AP level or just about almost AP level is what really we want students to have um, prior to taking the machine learning classes. Um, because the machine learning classes are kind of college level computer science at that point. Um, and so although you don't need um, to have the kind of algorithmic rigor that maybe like a USACO student have, and maybe you don't need to have like a really strong knowledge of any particular language, because when they switch into the AI track, they switch into Python. At that point, we've never taught them Python before. And so we kind of expect them to pick up the language as it's used in the context of AI problems. Uh, and so, yeah, it's it's a definitely an environment where they we expect them to be very fast, quick, and experienced, but not to actually have a lot of required base knowledge. And so it's an interesting distinction. It's like having exposed exposure a lot of computer science, have some very important course, yes, but it's not like they need to be, you know, a USACO gold winner, or they it's not like they need to like have um, mastered five or six languages or whatever, right? It's that that base fundamental is necessary. 
Okay. Um, yeah. And also um, for our younger students, how would they be able to, uh, if they are interested in pursuing our higher level classes, how are they uh, able to progress on our curriculum or where would they start if let's say they're um, only in middle school? So yeah, they would uh, be, okay. I guess I'll let Danny do it. No, no, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, you yeah, can I'll finish up soon, so I'll, I'll be off. But um, yeah, like as you can see from the image in front of you, like if they're in middle school or they're in elementary school, sometimes they'll take the fundamentals track, uh, possibly skip some of these lighter courses like the Fun 1B, Fun 2B, Fun 3B, CSO, OB. But um, we want them to take up, you know, up down the middle of that image, up the diagonal. I don't know if you can move your mouse <laughs> diagonally across it until they get towards the CSA 2485 at the top. Danny, did you, did you have anything to add for that? No, not at all. But yeah, they should have a good, um, um, they should have some programming background. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and um, oh, we have a question by uh, someone in the chat asking if there is a good programming site except Scratch. Oh. Um, and Python, a good programming site. Um, well, we we do have um, the coder on our website, um, so it would be uh, you could go to kdby.com slash coder, and there'd be um, an audio tutorial that you could use. Um, and we run processing through here. And then for younger students, you could use Java Blocks, which is drag and drop. So I hope that answers your question. Or uh, and Danny, if you have anything to add, would be for what would be a good programming site to use. Yeah, I think this is excellent. The coder, mm -hmm. the getibyte.com coder is an excellent way to start, especially for younger kids that uh, can drag and drop mm -hmm. and understand the concepts of programming than actually writing code. Mm -hmm. Yep, and if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to type it with, into the chat box and uh, we are taking a look at it. Oh, also another question um, from Lin Zhang, um, JavaScript or Java? Um, so it depends on, um, in terms of past experience, if you have a very strong JavaScript background that, you know, we're going to switch into Python for the class. Uh, most of our students who go into, uh, the AI classes have no Python experience and a lot of Java experience. And that's, that's great. And that's fine. But if you have a lot of Python experience, that's great too. And if you have a lot of C plus plus experience, that's fine. Um, the language is not as important as the concepts, like Danny said. Okay. Um, do we want to elaborate on the distinction between uh, JavaScript and Java? Like, but because we primarily teach our classes in Java. Yeah, the, that's like uh, French and German. They they are, um, they JavaScript is primarily used for web programming. Java is used for Android and a lot of enterprise applications. Um, yeah. Uh, when you talk about like tools, when you talk about like like someone said Eclipse, like these things are not actually that important prior to actually doing machine learning. Uh, obviously, Danny can talk more about what tools you use in CSA 2A4 and A5 uh, within Python. But prior to that, it's just a fluency with these types of problems. And I'll, I'll kind of leave that that, Jenny, and then um, you guys can take it from here. OK, that sure. That is absolutely correct uh, with what Ben said. So it is just a, a tool. It is not the, the concept or the, the idea behind what the tool does. Uh, do you have some tangible uh, examples of the, ty the types of tools that you do use um, on a daily basis? Sure. So a lot of the machine learning um, is run in Python. So we use Python and different libraries. And depending on what the application is, right? So because there's different stages of development, you can go from prototyping, creating a prototype, something simple that can run on your computer, and then something that can run on everybody else's computer. Right. So throughout this process, the tools differ a lot, but the idea behind everything, the concept, is what is really important. And not um, and the tools are more or less like just the transitioning of getting your idea into something tangible, something you can you can see you, it does something. Uh, have like a, an analogy of what that would look like for maybe like a maybe what 
in, in a different discipline for people who are not so familiar with um, with learning the process of learning CS. Like, is there a math analogy? Like, maybe instead of using a calculator, you're learning um, theories. Correct. So, for example, yeah, you could use an abacus to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, like the abacus that you just pull the the beads across. But you yeah. could also use the calculator, right? But then it depends maybe on what problem you're trying to solve. Maybe to add one is faster to do with an abacus than it is to do with a calculator. That is also something you can consider. And maybe an abacus is more visually explainable of what happens, or maybe the calculator is not waterproof, right? So like both of them have advantages and disadvantages, and it's not necessarily like, let's say, a calculator is better than an abacus. Maybe it is for some people, and they use that they do with a calculator. But maybe an abacus has uh, better attributes for some other domain. Uh, like you want to use it, uh, let's say, in a very humid environment, right? Um, it would work much better. That would be a good analogy, I think. OK, yeah, I like that. And um, what was your first programming language, just out of curiosity? So I started learning C++ from, um, there was a really big, huge book that was maybe like 500 pages or a thousand pages big. Uh, I, I cannot pronounce his name, but he's the creator of uh, C++ that has written that book. I see. And <laughs> yeah, and then I transitioned, which is bad programming language to start with, but then I transitioned to Java and then Python. I see. And then was the transition pretty um, st streamlined for you? Was it pretty simple to grasp? Or did it take some time to pick it up? That is like, yeah, that is true. So for example, like it's just speaking a different dialect, right? Or having an accent, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you could imitate someone else's accent in some way, you know, but you don't have, like you're still speaking the same language, right? Like yeah. it's still the same concepts between different programming languages, the same idea behind them. Uh, mm -hmm. So that doesn't change. But the way you express them, it does change. Like maybe some languages are easier to express a few things in them and to read them, but other languages are more difficult to express things and them take more time and effort to do. Right, 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 uh, definitely. Great, um, and also what do you think are some soft skills that uh, you would be able to acquire um, for, for high school students, but also for um, college students um, that are, like for example, like time management or uh, persistence and like what are some of those, those skills that you wouldn't think so much about? but uh, the students can start to acquire when they start um, conducting research? So starting research, definitely persistence, being meticulous, being precise in the way you conduct yourself, how you approach a problem, and being able to see a problem and come up with creative solutions, right? That you don't be independent in your thinking, that you don't necessarily have to go somewhere and ask someone for a solution, but think about how you are going to solve the problem, not how someone else has solved the problem already. Even if you do think about that, you think about how to make that better. Uh, so it it does develop a more independent spirit in terms of thinking, in terms of being critical, in terms of uh, problem solving, being a better problem solver. So it doesn't, for me, it doesn't just apply to my research, but I've noticed improvements in different aspects of my life on how I approach different kinds of problems outside of computer science itself. That's a really good answer. Um, yeah, because I think that's something that a lot of um, students would be able to realize uh, after a while, like um, failing multiple times and then maybe like at the end not being able to see the results that they want, but then um, making sure to like iterate on that and then be okay with with the idea of not succeeding and you know the general sense. Yeah, but overall you're still you're still learning and you're getting more information. Um, yeah, and it's seven o'clock now. Um, so I think we, if Danny, if you don't, do you have anything else you would like to add before we open the chat to more question and answer? Uh, no, I think, yeah, we pretty much covered everything uh, that uh, I had to say, but I'm open to questions. Okay, great. So um, people who are currently in the meeting, um, if you would, on the right side, there's a chat box. If you can open that up, and if you have any questions you would like to ask any, this would be a good time to do so. Um, if not, then 
we can also um, end the meeting at seven. I think that we, it's pretty quiet in the chat box, so no further questions. Um, we can talk also briefly about what you've been um, doing with the AI classes so far. Um, so do you have any like examples of uh, certain student projects that you've been helping out or like what your experience has been so far with, uh, or, or what, um, you've been doing so far with teaching those classes? Right, so, so far it's been a great experience. Some of the students have uh, uh, very creative ideas in solving problems that I would, I was not expecting um, at their age to have. That was very impressive to me. Um, do we have a question at what age you should start research? So research, I mean, you could start as early as, you know, in a way you can speak, right? You all constantly do research. You constantly ask questions. So uh, the type of research that uh, that I do, for example, you could start doing it uh, as early as you can program, more or less, as as early as you're able to, to solve a, a problem program programmatically and in a constructed way. Uh, there is no age limit at all. Um, what do you think is the biggest limit? Um, I am I'm realizing that it seems like hardware would be the biggest issue for a lot of the machine learning research that uh, our students are doing. Right, a, a big a big aspect of it is hardware and uh, finding uh, the correct. There is still a lot to be done in terms of uh, AI itself and improvements, but I think the biggest biggest problem is applying AI and machine learning to different domains and generating the data for it. Because it requires a lot of data, generating good data, generating a lot of data, and using that in a domain-specific problem. So when I say domain-specific problem, it means, for example, social sciences. Like, let's solve home homelessness with uh, AI and machine learning, which they're actually trying to do in Los Angeles, where I am. So they're using, or like, let's solve uh, forest fires with machine learning. Uh, so that is the biggest problem I see is uh, mainly applying it not so much as processing power anymore. Uh, we're getting there, and there is improvements constantly done in, let's say, architectures of machine learning and theoretical improvements of machine learning. But at this point, they're uh, not providing such a huge advantage and leap as much as the domain that can be applied in, uh, that can provide. Uh... What are the top problems that AI researchers face? So right now in AI, a lot of uh, the work revolves around improving uh, deep learning and using it in different uh, domains. So, for example, the work involves about building models, artificial intelligence models, that um, that w that train and learn much faster. First of all, with less data. Uh, second of all, and that perform as good or better than previous. Uh, techniques. Other than statistics, what other courses uh, are needed to do graduate research and machine learning? So statistics is needed, but um, it's not necessarily that you have to be very good in it. Uh, mathematics, a good general mathematical background on machine learning, um, you need to have and do research programming, computer science, and um, then domain specific, specific knowledge is something that many people ignore. So like AI is a large field and has many different uh, applications, right? But the research that you're going to be working on, you must understand the problem. You must be familiar with the problem and the data that involves the problem. So if you're trying to do AI research and just improve theoretical aspects of AI, then uh, purely being extremely good at mathematics is important. And if you're not, you cannot do that kind of research. But if you're doing research in AI and applying it, let's say, to solve wildfires, right? you have to understand forests, you have to understand trees, you have to understand the types of trees, the type of soil, how fires start, 
what is the conditions, the weather conditions that fire start under, so that you're able to then take AI and do something meaningful with it. So it doesn't just limit, let's say, to just improving AI, but applying it is also an important factor. And how you apply it and improving the applications of AI itself. Because some techniques, like a domain-specific problem, like let's say solving wildfires, may, might require a, a new mathematical uh, use of machine learning that has not been used before or has not been invented yet. So. Okay, great. And I don't, do we have any other questions? Okay, um, so it seems like we are um, at 7.06. So uh, this was scheduled to be end at around seven o'clock. So this is a good time. Um, and Danny, thank you so much for um, giving this talk and uh, enlightening our parents and students about the by Rachel <laughs> about these areas. Um, and if you have any questions, you can feel free to email us at inquiry at katiebyte.com. Um, and this seminar will, the webinar will be recorded. So we will post it also on YouTube and email all the attendants with the link to watch it and review the material afterwards. Um, and yep, yeah, uh, so thank you so much everyone for participating and have a good night. Thank you everyone, bye-bye. Yep, bye-bye.